Hello there, friends. Welcome again to Grace Baptist Church. We are coming to you on Sunday afternoon, August the 29th. Sunday afternoon, August the 29th here, and we appreciate you tuning in today. Hope you were able to watch the service this morning. Had a wonderful service. Time again for studying the Word. Take your Bible, and if you will, turn with me to Matthew chapter number 12, verse 33 and following. I'm going to be talking today on the importance of our vocabulary and the importance of using proper language and what we say. We talked about a little bit on Wednesday nights. When we study the book of Proverbs, it always talks about building others up instead of tearing others down. But these are the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and he's going to give us some great teaching on how to use our word properly. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get right into our message. Father, we thank you again for the day you give us. We love you, Lord, and you're so good to us. Thank you for the service this morning, another service here this evening. May it be used for your honor and glory, Lord, and we love you and praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, talking about words, I heard about a little boy came home one day from school and he had two black eyes and a bloody nose. <laughs> His mother asked, what in the world happened to you? And he said, wrong word to the wrong boy. <laughs> That's what happened to him. Now, I heard another story one time. Did you hear about the dog? I've got a little boxer. I love that little dog. I know a lot of you have pets. Some people like dogs. Some people like cats. Some people like fish. Some just like everything, you know. But I enjoy all animals, and the dog was a talking dog. Well, there was a guy who went everywhere, and he claimed his dog could talk. And one guy came up and said, well, I just don't believe it. I don't believe it. He said, well, we'll prove it to you right now. And they said, okay, let's do it. And he said, all right, listen to this. So he looked at his dog and he said, dog, what do they put on top of a house to cover it? He said, roof, roof, roof. They said, oh, come on, that's a simple question. Anybody could answer that. And he said, okay, I'll prove it again. Who was the greatest baseball player that ever lived? And he said, root, root, root. I said, oh, come on, get out of here. And the guy and his dog walked away, and the dog looked up at the owner, and he said, well, should I have said Hank Aaron? <laughs> anyway, somebody has said that many things are open by mistake, but none so frequently is one's own mouth. And I've done it many times. Have you ever opened your mouth at the wrong time? Introducing Thomas Edison at a dinner, the Toastmaster listed his many inventions, dwelling at length on the talking machine. And of course, the aged inventor then rose to his feet and smiled and said gently, I thank the gentleman for his kind remarks, but I must insist upon a correction. God invented the talking machine. I only invented the first one that could be shut off. <laughs> and so he says, you know, you have to be very, very careful. He was the inventor, Thomas Edison, of the telephone, the phonograph in his day. I met a few people in life <laughs> that I wished you had a button where you could stop what was being said because it was vulgar and nasty. You don't want to hear things like that, especially after you become a Christian. It should be automatic that we would want to say the right words to the right people and be a witness with our words. So anyway, the Pharisees in this passage are using some very evil, evil language. They were saying that Jesus is working his miracles through the power of Satan. Did you believe that? Now, that's what I'm talking about. Using vocabulary for the wrong reason. They actually said the Son of God is, is working for Satan. Didn't make much sense. Why? The devil's out to discourage, and we know that Jesus, he's out to encourage. Pharisees made a serious error. 
They attributed the works of Christ to the works of Satan. It was so serious that Jesus said, uh, that's the unpardonable sin, attributing the works of Christ to Satan. And never be forgiven for that. Pretty strong words. So I have to say we must be very, very careful when criticizing what God is trying to do in the world. Or criticizing maybe a church or a preacher or another Christian. We better watch what we say. Why? Because we know that it's very dangerous to say the wrong things about the work of Christ. He loves his church. And woe to that person who criticizes his church. And there's a lot of critics of the church, the local church. And I'd hate to have to answer for it, but thank God one day we who know Christ will be with him. We are the church. So number one, I'd like you to look there with me. I said Matthew 12, verse 33. First thing he teaches us is this. You'll know the person and what kind of a person they are by the fruit of their life. You know the person by their fruit. Now notice verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. You've heard that old saying. You'll know the tree by the fruit he bears. And fruit and tree belong together. Therefore, to say that while the deeds of Jesus such as casting demons out of a person, healing the sick, all these things were beneficial. And yet he himself is bad and doing it through the work of Beelzebub or Satan, that doesn't make any sense. Who is Jesus? He is judged by the fruit he bore. And he bore good fruit. You know he was God in the flesh. Nobody else did what he did. Nobody else preached the sermons that he preached. Nobody else healed the people that he healed. Nobody else walked on the water except for Simon Peter. He didn't stay long, did he? A good person's going to produce some good works. An evil person's going to produce some evil works. Just the law of life. Whatsoever a person sows, that's what he's going to reap. So Jesus basically has claimed that he is doing his heavenly father's work on this earth. And the Pharisees are claiming that Jesus is doing Satan's business. Now, when you examine all the deeds that Jesus has done, there's only one conclusion that you can actually come to. And that is that he was doing his works by the power of God, not by the power of Satan. That doesn't make sense. He healed the sick. He brought sight to the blind. He raised the dead back to life. He spoke the most beautiful words mankind has ever her. He saved me. He washed me. He cleansed me. And I kind of feel like old Paul. I was one of the worst of sinners. Paul said, I was the chief of sinners. I knew I was lost and I needed Christ. And I found him, or he found me as an 18 year old teenager. I'd never been the same. So, thinking about what they're saying here, is pretty dangerous. The Pharisees are claiming he's working through the power of Satan, and yet he is doing exactly opposite by his works. He is doing works that only God can do. Now notice again these words in verse 33. Jesus himself spoke these words. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. I underline that part. That part of that verse is the key. So the heart is the root. The language is the fruit. <laughs> if the nature of the tree be good, well, it'll bring forth some good fruit. Somebody said it like this. Where grace is the reigning principle in the heart, the language will be the language of Canaan. And on the contrary, wherever lust reigns in the heart, it'll break out. Diseased lungs makes an offensive breath and men's language discovers what country they are of. Are you of the heavenly country or are you of this earthly country? Jesus teaches we are to say what we mean and mean what we say. 
You get apples from an apple tree, pears from a pear tree, bananas from a banana tree. Think about it. Every tree produces its own fruit. You don't get apples off of an orange tree. And so a person who shows love and joy, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, that person is controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Galatians 5, write this down. Galatians 5, <clears throat> verse 22, and verse number 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, notice the characteristics that are produced in a person who is really saved and seeking to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. He is saying that we as Christians, we as God's people, we need to display these different characteristics in our life. How do you do it? Well, it's not so much writing them down and saying, I want to do this, this, and this. It's a matter of surrendering yourself to the Lord and saying, Lord, I surrender myself to you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And when you surrender to the Lord, these characteristics come out because he does a heart transplant. He gives you a new heart when you come to him. He'll save you and wash you and cleanse you of every sin. He'll put your foot back on the solid rock. And so these are characteristics that we have to check up on. Are we gentle, good? Do we have faith? Long suffering means patience. Do we have patience? I think about being a patient person. Sometimes I'm a little short on patience. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I heard it best described by somebody years ago. And they told me this, patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Seldom found in women and never found in men. <laughs> I'd have to say amen to that. But I will say God has given me more patience. When you read the book of Romans, it said tribulation worketh patience. God sends tribulations along to help us develop more patience. He loves us, even though we're not always loving. And God can help us love the unlovely. I was mentioning this morning in our Sunday school class that hurt people are usually the ones who turn around and hurt somebody else. And normally, if you've been hurt by somebody, they have been hurt, and they're taking it out on you, not just you in particular, on everyone. And so what we have to do is get over the hurt, turn it over to God, forgive that person, and don't dwell on it. Don't let it get you down. Don't let it stop you and your joy for the Lord and what you're doing for Him and enjoying your life that he's given you to enjoy. So, do you have any joy in your heart? If you do, it comes from Jesus. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. Joy carries the idea of delight, calmness, cheerfulness. And God gives us that joy when we have a cheerful heart in Christ. Happiness is different. I heard it explained like this. To be happy usually depends upon the what's happening around us. If good things are happening, we're happy. If bad things are happening, we may not be so happy, but joy is different. Joy is produced as a fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. We may not always be happy in what's going on in the world. If you look at Jesus, when he went in that temple, he showed he was the man's man. I mean, he is the gentle savior, but he could get pretty firm when he needed to. He went in the temple, turned the tables over, threw the money out the door. I'm sure they were thinking, who in the world is this? It's Jesus. He said, you've taken my father's house of prayer and turned it into a house of merchandise, selling these animals for sacrifices, but cheating the people, charging enormous amounts of money 
for them to obtain a sacrifice and doing it right in the temple. Why not outside? Why not away from the place of worship? And Jesus went in and claimed house. <laughs> and sometimes we may not be that happy, and I don't think he was that happy to see that, but I know he had a joy because he gives us that same joy. How about peace? Do you have a peace that passes understanding? The Bible said that when we know the Lord, we're not to worry about anything, but to learn to pray about everything. And then when we learn to pray about everything, guess what the result of that is? Peace. Peace comes in our heart. Boy, there's a lot of people searching in the wrong areas for peace. You'll never find peace in a pill or a bottle or a bed. You'll never find peace in a party. Those things are earthly amusements. They can never truly bring you peace in your heart. There'll still be a battle going on. And what we need is the one who is the Prince of Peace, and that's Christ. When you know Christ, he'll give you that peace. And it's a peace that passes all understanding. And so when you turn it over to God and pray about everything, the peace comes and the whole world can be falling down, but you still got joy and a smile. And somebody says, how in the world can they hold up so well when it looks like the whole life's coming apart? Well, the reason is it's not us and our strength, it's Christ and his strength holding us up. He's given us that peace. Everything's all right. Marvin, don't worry. Everything's all right. Whatever your name is, don't worry. If you know Christ, you can have that same peace. You just pray and trust God. Have faith. Have faith in God. He will do what he says he wants to do. Are you a patient person? Or are you an impatient person? Now, I've seen both. and I've probably been both myself. But I'm glad the Lord knows how to work on us. He knows how to get us back to where we need to be. Think about this. The Bible, on the other hand, speaks of the deeds of the person who is without Christ. Now, we just looked at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, meekness, temperance, self-control, all these things. But listen to what the Bible says is the characteristic of the unsaved person. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. We'll just read verse 19 and 20. It says here, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Of course, adultery would be unfaithful to a spouse. Fornication is unfaithful altogether in the marriage union. Uncleanness, impurity. Lasciviousness is unbridled lust. Pornography and all the other things that go along with that. And then he says in verse 20, idolatry and witchcraft and hatred and variance and emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. What do these things mean? Idolatry is the worship of anyone other than God. Witchcraft here in the Greek language carries the idea of drug abuse, sorcery, hatred, and variance. That's somebody who is very hostile, who wants to quarrel and fuss and fight. Emulation carries the idea of somebody who's envious of others. Don't be envious of somebody and what they have. God's been good to you. He's been good to all of us. He's been good to me. Better than I deserve. I thank God for the privilege to be able to teach and preach the Word of God. I can remember as a young man, 18 years of age, just got saved, but watching my preacher preach and just hoping and praying, God, please let me one day be a preacher. All I'd ever wanted to do was play baseball. I love to play baseball. I always enjoyed, and I wanted to be a major leaguer. I'm sure every little leaguer wants to be a major leaguer one day. Play in the big leagues. But once I got saved, I was talking to my dad about it today at lunch. I said, you know, if something just came over me and I didn't have that desire to even pursue a scholarship, which somebody had contacted me, and I'm wasn't that really that good. I'd never made the majors, but I can remember a school wanting me to come and play baseball. And I said, nah, I don't think so. 
And the reason for that was God was putting new desires in my heart. And I want to be a preacher. I want to go into ministry. And if God puts that in your heart, don't be scared to follow it. It's a blessed call of God. If he's calling you into the ministry, you follow his directions. Because I have found this. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he calls, he equips. He'll take care of you. So you don't have to be envious. You don't have to quarrel. Wrath and strife, that refers to the person who's always causing division. And that's sometimes very sad to see in churches, isn't it? Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. And then he says, avoid them. <laughs> now if somebody is trying to pull you away through division and strife and pull you away from your beliefs and your integrity and your morality for Christ, turn around and go the other way. No need to have to resist when you can just avoid temptation. And you could say, well, okay, I'll go with you and then I'll resist it. And the temptation can really be hard. But if you just say, I think I'm going to have to avoid and pass. I'm sorry. Then you don't get in that situation where you have to turn around and leave early, where you have to say no and they get all upset. Why? Because you are serving the Lord. You are God's servant. And so basically what Jesus is saying here, we will know the tree by the fruit it bears. We will know the person by the fruit that they bear and what they do in their life. Thank God he helps us bear good fruit. Use your life to bear good fruit for Jesus. Nobody's perfect. We've all sinned, but thank God we've got a Savior who still cleanses us. And he's promised, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just, just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When we come to the Lord, he saves us. And from that point on, when we sin, we don't lose our salvation, but we come back to him and confess it and he washes and cleanses it. And so always keep short accounts with the Lord. Use your life to be a witness for the Lord and use your vocabulary to build others up and not tear others down. We're going to stop right there. I thank you for tuning in this evening. I'll get back on it next week, Lord willing, and I hope you have a great week. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the time we've had to share the word. Thank you for the wonderful listening audience. We hear from them from time to time, and it thrills our heart. Bless everyone who listens to this message. May it be a help, an encouragement, also a challenge to us, because it comes straight from the Bible and the lips of our Savior Jesus, who is teaching us about the fruit of the tree. May it be good fruit. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, just want to thank you again for coming and stopping by and watching us this evening. Come see us at Grace Baptist, located at 435 NC Highway 62 West. We'd love for you to come next Sunday at 10 o'clock here at Grace Baptist Church. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you.